gosh. Happy, but ooh, I can't believe I missed it on the camera. I, I was fumbling with the controls. You guys can relate. My fingers are freaking, I can't even feel them. And I, I just got done putting on a, a second set of gloves. I'm shivering like a leaf. Day after day, hunt after hunt. It, it's, you know, 40, 50 extra pounds on your back with all the gear. Climb up, put it up, tear it down, put it up, tear it down, put it up, tear it down. It's so hard to self-film. It's so hard to self-film with a bow, for sure. But man, if I had a cameraman right there, what a beautiful shot. I mean, it drilled him right through here, that two-blade rage, he didn't go anywhere. He went down the draw, up the other side, and phew, tipped over. But I'm thankful. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Whew. You're too good to me. Hey, man. What's going on, Tom? I'm glad you came, man. Glad to finally be here. I appreciate you having me over. And, yeah. Uh, I think this is a cool idea. I yeah. Really I'm glad you came up with it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you and I came up with it. Yeah. It's our idea. Yeah. But uh, no, this is going to be something totally different than what we normally have done in the past, you know, just with a single topic. Right. Picking, uh, you know, what would, would we come up with? Six people? Right. Six, six people. Points. Yeah. Six questions uh, and, and hopefully answer them as best we possibly can. And uh, hopefully we do that good enough for them. So. Right. The theme being small property land management tips yeah. and hunting strategies. Uh huh. Hey, they even get a, a sweet hat out of the deal, right? That's going to inspire anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the way, I need an upgrade. Mine's a little old. Yeah, I'm the wrong person to talk to when it comes right. to that. We had a great question submitted to us, and it boils down to if you only have 40 to 80 acres, let's say, of land, and uh, you want to keep those deer on those property longer uh, during hunting season, what are some of the key things that you can do to keep those deer there? And it's a hard question to answer for the simple fact that it's, it's you have to take in consideration your hunting pressure that's surrounding your piece of property. Let's take Ohio for example. You know we have a great mix of ag and hardwoods in the area that um, in most of Ohio, but the hunting pressure. So my thing is is concentrate on the cover value, but not just cover, but cover that equals food. In my part of the world in central Indiana where my farm is located, cover isn't really a shortcoming. Uh, we are in a really a, a large hardwood ridge area with a lot of expanses of lo uh, just big timber country and uh, agricultural fields in the tops and bottoms with actually pretty light hunting pressure. So um, from my perspective, and each one of you can evaluate how this pertains to you specifically, if you feel like they are leaving your property for the food or if they're leaving your property for a, a more secure place, then you can um, hopefully diagnose your specific property and come up with the solution that will fit you best. In my part of the world, my answer for that question would be, I have the food source and that, that re uh, specifically relates to cool season annuals, uh, winter wheat, brassica blends that are becoming more um, attractive to the deer as the surrounding vegetation is browning off and dying and as the agricultural crops in the fields surrounding me are being harvested. Um, but I don't specifically focus on just cool season annuals. I also have the buffering of warm season annuals. We're talking soybeans, forage soybeans. I like the Roundup Ready varieties and corn that I can leave standing. So um, those are considered warm season annuals, but they come into their own in the cooler seasons. When the, think about it, when all the farmer's crops are gone and those fields are bare, it's, you've got the food source. For me, it's having the food when it's there, when it's needed the most. We had another great question submitted to us, and it's reference to what is the ideal percentage of what your property should be broken down into? Whether it be ag, whether it be old field type environment, should it be mostly cover? And that's another question that, you know, it all depends on where, where you uh, are from. Um, one thing that we try to do with our clients is that we take a big aerial view of just not their property, but the surrounding area. That's kind of going to help you dictate what you sh your property should be. If the surrounding area is mostly cover, quality cover, that we can tell from the aerial photograph, then we're going to concentrate on putting more uh, supplemental forages in your, as in your food plot. So it all depends on what the surrounding area is and what you have to start out with. Um, if you don't have a lot of ag, 
you know, obviously we can get a dozer in there and, cre and create some areas uh, for supplemental forages. But my thing is, once again, it all depends on where you, you're from and what's, what's your surrounding area being. And more times than not, to me, it all goes back again to cover. An old adage or an old saying that goes way back in the QDM and, and, and a lot of the QDMA advisors suggest that to have three to five percent minimum of your property and food. So if you own a hundred acres of timber, let's say for example, three to five acres of that should be in a food source. And so for me on my particular property, I literally scraped and chainsaw cut and cleared every top bench opening that I could. Um, to create an opening to plant into. And, and I think grand total, we ended up with about four acres, you know, on, on just under 60 acres. In timber country, it's what can you squeeze in up to that magic three to 5% number, and don't necessarily feel like you need to go over that. It, it takes a lot of time and money to do that. But the last part of that question is hunting, and uh, what percentage of your property should you dedicate to hunting? In reality, a lot of my hillsides on the, on the wooded ridges do not get touched and do not get entered and stand sites are entered and, and exited carefully with wind directions and, and the thought process of not bumping deer. So I would say probably 80% of my property is unhunted with maybe 15 to 20% of those stand locations if you look at the total acreage. How do you determine where the best food plot locations are on a small parcel of property? And a lot of times, I've got to say, even myself included, when I first started at this, it was the area that I thought was the coolest looking and I could just picture myself arrowing a big buck in a certain spot. But let me tell you, you've got to put a little more thought into it as far as what type of conditions do the plots need that you intend to grow need, what are required. Is that spot going to allow you to access it with equipment? For me in, in big wooded country of Indiana, um, my ridge tops and my bottoms, I mean really there's no side hill stuff, you just can't do it, it doesn't make sense. But on the ridge tops, even when you're selecting a particular location, think about sun orientation. Is it going to get any sun from sunrise in the morning to sunset in the evening? That being said, if you can, you want to orient your food plot sort of east and west rather than north and south. There's going to be a, an area of the field that's going to be shadowed most of the day and it's not going to grow very well. At the same time, if it's a high dry ridge and it's going to get baked in the sun all afternoon, a clover field is not going to be your best choice for that. So not only in terms of location, orientation of sun, um, the soil type of course. Um, just think about this way. Clovers and sort of the small legumes are going to do best in a more lower bottom field that's a little bit somewhat it's going, to be, it's going to be well drained, but it's going to be a moisture soil. Your upper ridge tops, you can grow your brassicas, you can grow your soybeans and corn and some other winter wheats and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into it, uh, not just where you think it's going to look the best. Think about the soils, think about the moisture, think about sun orientation, think about hunting it, getting in and out of there undetected. So put all those factors together and make a good decision based on those. We are standing in a food plot right now that we're planting. You can see Tom and the tractor behind me. My plan right here is to put Pennington deer greens in this little plot with the Furminator today. I'm gonna go into that standing corn and top sow the same deer greens into that. Now this is about a two and a half acre corn field that we put the nitrogen on back in June. What I'm gonna do, we'll sow deer greens in basically the whole thing and we'll be looking at Dual purpose food plot, fall food plot, the whole nine yards is gonna be absolutely freaking awesome. Never know, but we shall see. October can't get here fast enough. Maybe just another way of looking at things is that, you know, managing white-tailed deer is a 365 day program. Producing areas like those bottom areas if you're in hill country uh, that has that fertile soil but you can't hunt it. The wind is going to kill you. But that doesn't mean that you can't put a food plot there. 365 days. That's the mindset you're going to uh, have to have. Just because you can't hunt it doesn't mean you can't plant it. Stay out of it. It's for them, not for you. It's to get that button head, that year and a half to the next level. It's always about Never the now, it's always about the future. That's Deer Management 101 right there. We've been doing web shows for over two years now, correct? That's right. 
And I know, speaking for everybody, is that I know there's only one thing our, our common goal is, is to educate our viewers. It's our passion to educate. We all know a little bit about something and hopefully we do a good enough job of reaching it out to you so you can go out there and, and, and do the management that we talk about, whether it comes to predator control, control burning, food plots, etc. And what makes us different compared to everybody else is that we, you know what, we want to reach you. We want to hear what you have to say about the management advantage. When everybody else is going to go left, we're going to go right. We want to be the leader in wildlife management. And how we go about that is through you. So hopefully today, you know, we, we did a good enough job for that. Well, I think this was an interesting twist, the, the concept of tying the viewers directly into the show and you guys submitting questions to us. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we tend to go over topics on, on the next upcoming idea for mm -hmm. the show, and we think, yeah. this is what I think we should do. Yes. But this is a great way to find out what you guys want us to do. And so obviously this is the first, hopefully of many, because yes. I think this is a great trend that yes. we've started today. And it's going to be inexhaustible because the questions yes. should be and will be unlimited, I yeah. believe. So stay tuned. Uh, hopefully this is a growing trend if we didn't screw it up that bad, right? That's correct. <laughs> so stay tuned. Love you watching TMA. Thanks, guys.